Hello my quilting friends. Good morning from the Pacific Northwest. I'm on the Oregon coast and loving every minute and I bet you guys are kind of living vicariously through my morning videos on the beach. We're staying in a condo and I think I've mentioned before we usually come with some other friends. This year it's just one other couple so we got this smaller condo than we sometimes get and we're on the fourth floor. So that's why you get such a lovely view off my patio across the ocean. So very nice. Let's see who's checking in. Oh gosh, quite a few of you already. Janet, woohoo, made it for a live from North Carolina. Hope your vacation is going swimmingly well. Yeah, I see what you did there, but I'm not swimming in that cold ocean. No, no. Deb in Brantford, Ontario. Pamela in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Love all your videos. Tammy, hello in Arkansas. Crochet Mama from Farmington, Missouri. Is that the MO? Forgive me if I'm wrong. Teresa in Oklahoma. Peggy in Southern California and Shannon from Alaska. Awesome. Nice to see you here, Shannon. There's a few more of you checking in. Hi, hi, hi. I won't spend a ton of time saying good mornings because I want to get talking today. Today's topic is how do I get started? And there's a couple angles to approach this from and because these are just impromptu, it's just going to be a casual chat. I don't know that my thoughts are organized in a particular order, but Today I am going to talk about some practical tips of how to get started, equipment and skill wise. And then I think I'll do another dive into this topic maybe next week. Um, a couple people have emailed or messaged me and asked, like, how do you get over the frozen sort of I, you know, terror a little bit of starting? Fear of wrecking the quilt, fear of I don't know what to do next, all those things. So we'll talk about how to get past the fear and intimidation a little bit. But today we're gonna be fairly practical. So let's say you've never free motion quilted before. Where do you even begin? A couple ways you can approach this and I'll tell you my story because this might work for you too. When I first started machine quilting, I did not have a long arm and I had never stitched on one. I'm not even positive that I knew very much at all about them. I grew up, as many of you know, in very northern Canada, so I didn't have access to guilds or quilt shows particularly, so though I made quilts my whole life, I really was not involved at all or even uh, had the industry visible to me to see what was, what was new and happening, right? I did have a rotary cutter and a mat, <laughs> that was about as high tech as it got. So when I started thinking about machine quilting, it was because I now lived in Washington State and I did not have friends who were hand quilters like I had been until that point and so the thought of hand quilting things all by myself was way too time consuming. I wanted to make more quilts and so I took advantage of a local quilt shop who had a class on machine quilting at your domestic machine and I took that class. Best thing I ever did. Chris was the teacher, super practical and the first thing she said literally was don't be afraid to just start quilting. I took that advice to heart. I'll say it today and I'll repeat it again next week when I talk about getting over the intimidation. Um, Chris's advice was to just start. You have to start to get the feel for it. There's, there's no real shortcut to that. It's like learning as a first grader to write a letter with a pencil. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel unwieldy and ugly, but you just have to start somewhere. So I'm at this machine quilting class and we start with doing things like L's and E's and loops and so forth and those very basic practices. But I also took Chris's advice to heart in this way. I started quilting quilts with it. I didn't wait until, you know, I had done a hundred practice sandwiches and had kind of figured it out. I just started quilting quilts. Un undemanding, um, undiscriminating recipients, indiscriminate, I don't know what the word is that I want, but recipients that didn't really care what the quilting looked like, right? So I just dove in to quilting and that's where my practice came from. And I've kind of followed that advice to this day. When I want to try something new on a quilt, I just dive in with both feet. Some of my early custom quilts were in my first year of long arm quilting and they were intricate and detailed and had a ton of stuff that I didn't know how to do when I started. I just figured it out as I went. So that's a great piece of advice. So really the advice was consider taking a class at a local shop just because seeing other people doing it, having a teacher that can see what you're doing and looking over your shoulder and giving you practical on the spot suggestions is really, really helpful. Even if a long arm is in your future, and you know that's what you ultimately want to do and to and to get to acquire consider taking a domestic class 
just because it gives you a feel for it and you learn a ton of knowledge about quilt sandwiches and stitch length and tension and all those very practical things that apply no matter what type of machine you're quilting on. So let me take a minute and go back through some questions and comments before I go further. Good morning, good morning, and hi, this is all awesome, but I'd be here for a long time if I repeat them all. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any questions that relate. Mary Rose Spriggs had trouble with the corners, and do you mean kind of getting stuck in your design in the corners and not being able to quilt out? And if so, the echo is your friend. Echo your way out. Andrea is asking, where are you? It looks like a beautiful day. I am on the Oregon coast. Mountains of Colorado, awesome. Mary is saying she practices on charity quilts. Yes, that's absolutely an option. And when I say that I you know, practice on quilts where the recipients were not knowledgeable quilters, certainly comfort quilts or charity quilts would have been among them. Children would have been among them. So children of my friends, shower gifts even, things like that. Um, but there are lots of avenues for charity quilts. Maybe that's a good topic actually for one of these mornings is places that you can find charity quilts to work on. Michelle made it to the live, Toastine, Indiana. Larger frame, new machine, yay. Sherry, it certainly is a different world with all this online help. Yep, that is so true. And that was just beginning when I started quilting. M. Miller is asking, does stitch regulation help or speed control? Yes, it does. Uh, that's a topic I think I'll delve into a little deeper in another episode too, whether to use stitch regulation or not, and why you might choose one or the other. But it is certainly helpful when you're learning a new design, just because it removes one thing you need to think about, which is how fast you're moving the fabric or how fast you're steering with your hands. It's just one less thing to think about and you can focus on your stitching path instead. But let's talk about some more practical things about starting. Um, at a domestic machine, let's start there first. You've taken a class, you have a little domestic sewing machine that you've been piecing on, you're wondering, is this appropriate for machine quilting? I mean, ultimately, the answer is yes. I have a friend who, her business name is Featherweight Doctor. You might be interested in following her. Her name is Darlene. And she machine quilts on featherweight machines. And many of you will be familiar with featherweights and know how really, really tiny their throat space is and she machine quilts on them so you can quilt on anything. But it's probably easier to do larger quilts on machines that have a little bit more throat space. But you know, that's optional. Start with what you've got. But for sure, you do need a machine in which you can lower the feed dogs or cover them. There are some devices for covering them and I personally haven't tried them all out so I can't speak to how well they work but you need something where the feed dogs are not grabbing your fabric from underneath, right? They've either got to be covered so you can move smoothly over or they've got to be able to be lowered so that you can move smoothly over them. So this is at a domestic machine. So feed dogs are a thing and also having the correct foot on your machine. And basically you need a foot that does not rest on the fabric and travel, but that bobs up and down, some type of hopper foot. Because again, that enables you to move the fabric freely, be, you know, kind of between every stitch. You've got that freedom of moving and it just hops down long enough to take the stitch. From that, even within hopper feet, there are all kinds of variations for visibility wise. There are full circles, there are C-shaped ones, there are tiny ones, there are bigger ones. There are ones that work with rulers. Explore what your machine brand has to offer and best way to find that out is to go into a store that sells that brand and ask them what some of the options are. But for sure, you need to manage those feed dogs and for sure you need a hopper foot that hops up and down so that you can move your fabric under it. And then just start practicing. Okay, now if you're diving into a long arm already, places to start. One would be again to go into a shop that sells them they will give you an opportunity to test drive. Usually the store staff has at least some knowledge, some stores more than others I have found. Um, and sometimes they will have different models that you can try. But even better is to go to a quilt show or fair that has multiple vendors. And often the multiple brands will be there. You'll see Gamble there and Innova there and Nolting there and Bernina there and all the different brands. And you can literally walk from one vendor booth to another and try them and compare. Some of the things I suggest you compare. Uh, one would be noise, believe it or not. 
Um, I hate to kind of drop names here, but for example, Noltings sound like a John Deere tractor. Berninas purr like a Cadillac. That's one comparison. That may not matter to you, but it might. Another thing to compare, stitch speed. Some machines have a very high stitch per minute uh, ceiling. Gamel's one of those. I think they go up to 3,000 stitches a minute, which is a lot. Others have a lower stitch speed, so that might matter to you. And then kind of the usual characteristics, which would be, you know, do you want the computerized model or not? And what is the throat space on the long arm? So for a long arm machine, um, usually the name will have a number in it. Like for example, I run a Bernina Q24. It's got a 24 inch throat space from the back of my machine to the needle by me. And they vary. I think 16 is about the smallest long arm. And I think Nolting makes a 32 or 36. So they really, really vary. So that will depend on what type of quilting you're doing on how tall you are. The really big ones generally are best if you're going to drive them with a computer, right? You, you can't really quilt at a 30 inch depth. Your arms aren't that long. But if, you're, if it's being driven by a computer, that gives you a huge amount of quilting that you can do in one pass. So those are all things to consider. We're already at 11 minutes. Let's look at some questions and comments here. Mandy, I found starting out, I pick a part of day I'm most relaxed like a quiet Saturday and remember to breathe. That's a really good tip. So yeah, always accepts charity quilts, great. There are so many organizations that do. I'll seriously try and put my thoughts together and have a few to give you, maybe in one episode next week, a few places you can look or inquire about charity quilts. Like some, like so yeah, just accept them ready-made but it's all your stuff. But there are organizations where people piece quilts and then they're looking for people to quilt the quilts. And that's the place for you if you want to learn how to machine quilt. Jennifer is saying ideas would be helpful. I'm not a guild member currently. There's places where you can just go to websites and find them. It has nothing to do with the guild. Carolyn's Mercantile, where do you keep all of your stitching designs? Are they all in your head? Yep, they are. I also keep quite a few of them are on a Pinterest board. So Stitched by Susan is my account. And I have a gallery of edge to edge quilting designs. Not all of them are there because I'm not as faithful as I could be about uploading pictures, but all the pictures that are there are my freehand quilting designs. Diane Quilts of Valor may be looking for long armors, often true. Lisa Forbes started with a whole cloth, so a mus with a muslin back on her long arm. That's a great way to practice. You can see the best on a whole cloth. Side note, I have several episodes on my YouTube channel on making baby-sized whole cloth quilts. They're not super duper beginner designs, but the same, um, some of the principles you could adapt, you know, doing things in rows, for example, and making a practice piece into an actual quilt. Um, that's a, a good place to start too. Deborah, how did you decide on your first long arm or, or did you use your sewing machine? So I did start with my sewing machine. I had one that had like an 11 inch throat, which is fair sized. I actually started quilting for hire on my domestic sewing machine. I mean, looking back, I was nuts because it took me so long to finish a quilt. I was making about three bucks an hour, I'm sure. Anyway, it's where I started and I got a lot of practice in. So there's that. I got paid $3 an hour for practicing. But I shortly, um, a friend introduced me to her long arm and, and I knew that that was what I wanted. So I went hunting for a used long arm initially and I did have a couple of criteria. Freehand quilting was what I wanted to do, so a computer was not in my criteria. I did want to have a stitch regulator, and I did want to have a machine that was kind of industrial quality, right? The, the, the rollers, the ball bearings, the wheels that turn, the stitch quality. I, I knew I wanted to do this for a job, so I didn't want to go home level, like too, too, too small. You know how they just, they don't have the durability or the speed or the industrial qualities that I wanted. So my first machine was a Gamel. It was about 17 years old. I got that machine and I quilted, I don't know, something like 750 quilts on it before I upgraded. It served me super, super, super well. They are hard wearing machines for sure. So that was my first one. Paula, I'm looking to eventually do some free motion quilting on my home sewing machine. No room nor funds for a long arm. I mean, your home sewing machine is a great resource. There are lots of quilters, particularly ones that don't do it for a business, but that do it for themselves, that use their home sewing machine, and even quite a few pattern designers. I think of um, Quilty Love, 
Uh, her first name is Emily, Emily Dennis. As far as I know, she quilts, she produces a ton of patterns and quilts. And as far as I know, she quilts them on her domestic machine. Occasionally, I think, sends them out to a long armor, but you always see in her videos her quilting them on her machine. So that is perfectly, perfectly acceptable. Ann Taylor Handy Quilter has a 15 inch. That's what I have, good to know. Peggy, good point. Another thing to consider is the customer service a company has. That is a good point. So the company as a whole, their reputation matters, but in particular, your brand, is there a dealer near you or help that you can find if you really need it near you? That is a really good point to consider. Vicki, first time live. Susan, you've been a lifesaver in my long arm journey. Yay! The C, lifesavers. See what I did there? Louise is saying, looking for a long arm check about support teaching and technical. Yep, really good points. I think less critical, honestly, than it was 10 years ago, just because there are quite a few resources online nowadays. And maybe in conjunction with that, I'll mention something else I've found to be true. As the YouTube sort of library of content expands, I find it helpful to look for people that have my uh, teaching style, not necessarily my quilting style. Do you know what I'm saying? You know how sometimes a person will tell you instructions and it's like, Shh, I did not get that at all. And another person will explain the same thing, but it's in a way you understand. Look for people that speak your language, if you will, on YouTube and follow them because that's how you'll learn the easiest and find it the less, less frustrating. And so if at first you don't understand or grasp a point, don't, don't throw it out and assume it's not for you. Look for someone else that is teaching that skill. You know, Angela Walters' teaching skill is very different from Natalia Bonner's, which is very different from Karen Marchetti, right? So just look for a style of teaching and maybe of quilting that appeals to you. There's so many teachers out there online offering free content. There's no shortage anymore. Uh, I'm machine quilting on a Bernina 820 on a long arm frame. Challenging. So I don't even know what a Bernina 820 is, but I think that's a sewing machine, right? So it would be a shorter throat space than a 15 inch, but you've got it loaded on a frame. That would be challenging because it limits, you know, the width of your pass. Peggy, I'm having trouble having a service person to help with the timing. I can't help you with that directly. I will give you one other hint that I have found to be helpful is Facebook groups. Now, I know some quilters have strong feelings about Facebook, that's entirely up to you. But if you do use Facebook, if you have specific questions about your brand or a specific thing like timing, consider asking in a Facebook group that has people with the same brand. You'll find a wealth of knowledge in there. You'll also find 100 bajillion comments that mean nothing to you. But you know, out of 100, you might find a couple really meaty ones and there are people on there that have enormous experience. So I have often gone to those groups when I have specific questions. Uh, Julie, been watching you a few weeks and I'm getting braver. Awesome. Good to hear. Mary Rose, you have original patterns I've not seen elsewhere. Thank you for that. I, I try. I try. You know, there's really nothing entirely new under the sun, but I at least try to have my own interpretations of quilting designs. And um, I recently did a quilt. I can't even remember if I've posted pictures of it yet, but it has a kind of ferny quilting design. And this was just like 10 days ago, I quilted this one and that's a new design for me. And it sprang directly from the fabric that was in that quilt. So that was really fun. That's how I love to come up with new ideas. So if you have, if I haven't posted it already and I can't recall, it'll be coming within the next week or two. I've got pictures and reels of it coming up. Teresa, I knew nothing about a long arm, but my husband did all kinds of research and surprised me. We got a used gamel from Doug and Martha Creasy. I love it. What an awesome surprise. Mine did not surprise me and he didn't know much about long arms either, but he was a ton of support and took me shopping and hauled it home and set it up, and did all the things. So that was lovely. Guess who Nancy, love your background view. I love your name. Guess who Nancy? Um, doo, 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 doo. My long arm is about nine years old and is no something, oh, no longer supported by the company. Oh my, that's not good. I hadn't even thought of that one, honestly, but you know, maybe consider if you're spending big dollars like long arms are, consider companies that have got a bit of history and are gonna be around for the long haul or have a husband who's super duper duper handy. <laughs> anyway, okay, you guys, we're almost at 20 minutes, so this has gotten long. I appreciate your questions and your comments for sure. 
and I'll be back tomorrow. I can't recall now what tomorrow's topic is. I think it has to do with thread because people have been asking that question. Yesterday I talked about when you might use different weights of thread in your quilting, but a lot of questions came like, how do you know what to do top and bottom and where do you start with bob and tension? You know, what's your kind of baseline? And so I think we'll talk about that tomorrow. So I am live right here on YouTube for 30 days, right up until October 27th mostly in the morning between 8 and 9 Pacific time-ish. So if you check in around that time, you'll see my live scheduled and you can see exactly when the time is and ask YouTube to notify you. If you're enjoying this, please, please give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications of whenever I go live. So until next time, happy stitching and have a great day.